title of our message here today is The Need for a Priest, as we look at some verses in chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter, uh, really those two verses, but or chapters, the reality for the need for a priest. I shared with you last week as we looked at the sacrifices, the chapter 1 was a burnt sacrifice that had to do with belonging to God. There is a loneliness in man that we are, we're lonely for God, and the burnt sacrifice is a picture of offering your life to God. Chapter 2 is about the grain offering. We, we have a need to be satisfied. Don't you want to be satisfied with life? And the grain offering is a picture of that bread of life that came down from heaven, the Lord Jesus. And as we feed upon his life, we'll experience a deep satisfaction. Chapter 3 was about a peace offering. And you and I both need peace with God and the peace of God, an inner tranquility in the trials of life that we can have from the Prince of Peace. And then chapter 4 and 5, we couldn't get to it last week, but chapter 4 and 5 is the sin offering and the trespass offering, and that was the need to confess that I am guilty, you are guilty of missing the mark. There's three words that the Bible uses to define your sin and my sin. The word sin is the most general, and it means to shoot at a target, but just to miss. You might be trying to do well, but you're shooting at the bullseye. You picture an archer shooting there, but you're just a little off to the left. You're a little high. You're a little low. You're to the right. And, and you've sinned. You've missed God's mark of perfection. There also is transgression or trespass, which means if you've ever walked up to a fence and it says, private property, no trespassing, you went, oh well, and over the fence you went. That's when we know what God's word says and we do it anyway. We know it's sin. It's not an ignorance. And then thirdly, there's, the Bible says iniquity. Iniquity means a twistedness or a bentness inside of our character that hasn't made its way out yet. But your thoughts, my thoughts, actions, words, all kinds of things. So we have a need. Why do you feel guilty in your conscience? Because we're guilty. <laughs> because we've done wrong things. Why do I feel guilty? Because I've done bad stuff, right? Okay, so if there's all these sacrifices instituted so that you and I can have a life of meaning and purpose, well, then we need, we need a priesthood. We need a priest. And that's what Moses and the children of Israel are experiencing. And so we pick it up in chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, as we see Moses presenting to the congregation, if you will, they're having a church service. He presents Aaron and Aaron's four boys, or the sons that are going to be the priests. It says in verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, the anointing oil, a bull as a sin offering, two rams and a basket of unleavened bread, and gather all the congregation together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So Moses did as the Lord commanded, and the congregation was gathered together at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And Moses said to the congregation, this is what the Lord commanded to be done. What is this that the Lord has commanded to be done? That there be a priesthood. You see, a priest has a fairly simple job as far as its description. A priest represented a loving, holy God that cares about people, and he represented that holy, loving God to heartbroken, fallen, insecure, fearful, sinful people. And then in return, after he represented to the Lord, to these brokenhearted people, that God loves you and wants to work in the issues of your life, then the priest would turn around and he would intercede on their behalf to the Lord in prayer. A priest has a pretty easy job. And as we think about that in this context, I want you guys to know is Aaron, who is the high priest, and the high priest, it's called the Aaronic priesthood. Aaron, uh, as the high priest, he would be high priest until he died, and then his oldest son would become high priest until he died, and then his son would be the high priest until he died. And so ultimately, the Aaronic priest, no, priesthood no longer exists because when Jesus came, he became, according to Hebrews, our great high priest. And so there's a little adage that I want you guys to grab a hold of, and you might write it, write it down if you're a note taker, that because we're New Testament Christians and there's this Old Testament experience with the Jewish people, that we see types and figures and shadows that actually point to a greater spiritual reality for our life as far as the priesthood's concerned. And this is the way it works. That the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed and the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. Meaning that if we're to look at this Old Testament passage of a priesthood with Aaron, the high priest, and his sons helping him, 
what is the connection? How would you and I connect the dots to our life? Because if this is an old priesthood for an ancient people and it's 3,500 years ago, what's that have to do with you and me, right? So many people hate church and they hate the Bible because it just goes and it's this long, boring, dusty history lesson. No, no, no. It, it has practical, immediate application for your life and my life. And this is it. If the Aaron, the high priest, would die and then his sons would always die, when Jesus came to be the great high priest and die and rise from the dead, he's the great high priest that's never going to die because he's the resurrection and the life. Okay? And he takes on that picture of what is the Melchizedek priesthood, right? And these might be familiar terms for us in our area because of our Mormon neighbors. And our Mormon neighbors, they embrace an Aaronic priesthood and a Melchizedek priesthood. And I hate to be the one to break the news to them because they seem to enjoy it so much, is that the Aaronic priesthood no longer exists. And if it did exist, you could only be a descendant of Aaron and there would have to be animal sacrifices. It has absolutely no validity today because our great high priest, Jesus, has come, died as a sacrifice, rose from the dead. And only the Lord Jesus can hold the Melchizedek priesthood because it's the power of an endless life, Hebrews chapter 7 says. And so you'll have people share with you, I have the Aaronic priesthood, or I have the Melchizedek priesthood. I want you to know that, that you're, uh, you're not underprivileged compared to that as a traditional historic Christian because I want you to know that every single one of you in this room that believe in Jesus, the Bible says, you know what? You all have the priesthood. Isn't that cool? If you believe in Jesus, just raise your hand. If you believe in Jesus as your Savior, raise your hand. Check out this room full of priests. This is awesome. Woo! Okay. So it's not some, uh, a priest is not somebody with a, a cool a clerical collar and that the priest is way up here and the lay people are second class spiritual citizens and they're way down there. No, no. It's even. I'm a priest and you're a priest. Male, female, sons and daughters of the king. If you doubt me, look at these couple of passages of Scripture that the New Testament makes it emphatic. First of all, Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it tells us this. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, notice what he's done for us, to him who loved us, Jesus loves us, and he washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us, verse 6, has made us kings and priests to his God and Father to, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that cool? So we are kings and priests. What's that mean? What does a king do? A king rules over a dominion, right? If you're a king, this is your kingdom. And so God says when we, you and I believe in Jesus, we become spiritual royalty. And all of a sudden, the kingdom of God, we have a king, Jesus, and he's given us dominion over, first of all, our life. And then when your spouse believes in the Lord, there's that kingdom. And then your children believe in the Lord, there's the expanse of the kingdom. And in this room right here, the church, we've come together. And because so many people believe Jesus, this is the kingdom that the Lord Jesus is our great king. But you and I are sons and daughters of the king. So that means that we are royal. And God gives us areas of ministry and areas of service and areas to love and to exercise dominion in our life where God has brought his kingdom to bear in our lives, correct? So secondly, we are priests, and priests, you and I are priests. Not only does John the Revelator declare that to us, as the Lord tells him, but in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, look what it says. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, notice, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. These Old Testament priests, they offered physical, animal, blood sacrifices. You and I offer up spiritual sacrifices. The Bible says that when we worship the Lord, we're offering Him the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. When we minister and we give, the Bible says this is a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. We, when we minister to people God's love, we are exercising spiritual uh, ministry as priests. So if you believe in Jesus, once again, this is the thing that revolutionized the first century church. Everybody was a priest. Everybody was in, I want you to know, everybody here that believes in Jesus, you're in full-time ministry just like me. But your ministry is on your farm, it's in the workplace, it's in the shop, it's in the office, it's in your classroom, it's wherever you are. You're a full-time priest because you know what? Wherever you go, you're going to find what? Hurting, broken, lonely, sinful people. And what do they need? They need to know that there is a God that loves them 
and Jesus died for them, and he shed his blood so that they could be washed, they could be clean, and they could come into a relationship with God, right? And you just have to share that with them. It's no big deal. You say, oh, I'm so freaked out by that. Well, no, that's what a priest does. Just tell them what Jesus did in your life. It's simple. You say, well, I don't know enough Bible verses. What if they come back with something I don't know? You know what? If they say, ask you X, Y, and Z, and you don't know the answer, look at them and smile and say, I don't know, but what I do know is that Jesus loves me and died for me and rose from the dead, and I have faith in him, and you should come hang out with our church family and experience this incredible abundant life that he offers us, right? And so with that reality, as now, as I've connected the dots for us from an ancient document, 3,500 years old, to modern day, this applies to you and I, let's look at some of the lessons that come from this passage of Scripture as we see the types and the pictures and the shadows here. I'm only going to touch on a few of them because there's more than that here. But when we look at this and we think about this, we want to first of all deal with the priesthood, and then we want to deal with the presence of the glory and the power of God. It tells us in verse 12 and 13, notice what the priests need. This is the garments or the equipment, if you will, chapter uh, 8, verse 12 and 13. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Then Moses brought Aaron's sons and put tunics on them, girded them with sashes, and put hats on them as the Lord had commanded Moses. So there are four things that happen here. In our typology, in our picture, if Aaron, the great high priest, is a picture of the Lord Jesus in your life and my life, then you and I are a picture of sons and daughters of Aaron. And they get four things. First, Aaron gets anointed with anointing oil. And at different passages, uh, to put all this together, they are also anointed. And the anointing oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit, right? The thing that we're intimidated by is we, we don't feel like we have the power or the courage to be bold enough to share Jesus with someone, right? So what do you need? You need the power of the Holy Spirit, right? I don't know if you have, I have an old school slider phone. People make fun of me because I don't have a smartphone. The thing I love about my old school slider phone is that I don't have to charge it up for about four days. And you smartphone people, man, you're just plugging it in all the time. But you know, it's a bummer. I don't know what your phone makes, the noise, when it's, the battery's about ready to, de- to die. And I, it's always an important phone call. And I have this annoying short little charger cord. So if I plug it in a wall, I'm like bent over trying to talk like this. And it's got this beeping sound that, me, me, me. I mean, it's so annoying. And, and my battery's dying and I'm trying to communicate. And, 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 and what's that annoying beep saying? It says, you got to plug into power, right? This phone is going to be absolutely worthless unless it is connected to power, correct? And so you and I, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit and live in the daily awareness. Every day I wake up, and I want you guys to know this is how I walk through it. Lord, I I want to be useful for you today because I'm your priest. And you guys, if you believe in Jesus, you're his priest too. But I'm not going to be able to do that unless you empower me by your Holy Spirit. I really need the power of your Holy Spirit. And it tells us in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, that our Father in heaven will give us the Holy Spirit if we just ask. A dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit. So number one, if you're going to be a good priest for the Lord, you need empowerment, so you need that anointing. And it is a reliance. Now we receive the Holy Spirit, obviously, at salvation. But the Lord, I don't know, the Lord has this unique way of wanting to make us dependent to know that our service is coming from the source of His Spirit. So he makes us feel needy and dependent on that. Number two, we see that they're clothed in garments. They have tunics. And these priests are going to be clothed in the righteousness of God. How can you and I be priests? Why? Because we're not perfect, right? I mean, I don't know if you're perfect or not. Some of you got a blank look. Like, what are you talking about? I I am perfect. I'm not perfect. How How come I get to be up here and share with you guys? Do I deserve it? Am I good enough? Have I arrived? Is there some level of perfection? (laughs) No, I'm not perfect. What am I? I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. I am pursuing to become more and more like him every day like you guys. But I'm not going to be perfect until I get to where? Heaven. I'm not going to arrive here. I got a secret. Don't let it out. Shh. Be very, very quiet. I am serving the Lord not because of me, but in spite of me. It's called grace. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, I'm not freaked out about my imperfect life. There's mistakes in my past in ministry, and there's going to be mistakes in my future. Not because I want to make them. I don't want to make them. But because I'm human. 
right? And so this is the reality. This is what usually freaks people out. They don't want to speak for God because they feel like, who am I? I'm this messed up, flawed person myself. Well, join the crowd. That's who God uses. Did you know that? He uses people like us that are just common, ordinary folk that Jesus has shared his love with. So realize this. You're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I shared with you a few weeks ago that when an animal, when that person in the Old Testament sense, they transferred all of their guilt, sin, and shame on an animal, and then that animal died. But the priest examined the person presenting the sacrifice or the animal, not the presenter, the sacrifice. The sacrifice had to be without spot or blemish, correct? And I want you to know that our sacrifice, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, the Lord Jesus, he's without spot. He's blameless. He's without blemish. And so when people want to look at me and say, you're not, you don't have it all together. You're not perfect. I said, I, I know, but you're, you're looking at the wrong person. The Lord Jesus is perfect, and he's extended to me his righteousness. Number three, here we have the anointing. We have power. We are clothed in righteousness. So, so now I have a new freedom. You know what? I, I don't have it all together, and when I get to heaven, I finally will, but I'm not waiting till then to be used by God. And so thirdly, there is this, it says their waist was girded with a sash. And the whole thought of a girdle or a belt is about a servant. Because you see in their culture, it's kind of a different culture for us Western men, is that their culture is they wore robes or a dress, if you will. And so they had to have a belt because if they're going to do hard work or they're going to serve in some capacity, they had to hike up their skirts, right? And they would pull them up and then stuff them in their belt. That's why the Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind. It doesn't mean wrap a girdle around your head. It means get ready in your mind to think straight about the things of the Lord. And so the sash is a picture of all God's servants. I'm a servant. I want to serve people. I want to serve God. I want to serve my wife. I want to serve my kids. I want to serve you guys. I'm here today serving you guys. I want to serve people before service. I want to serve people after service. I want to serve people in my life. You see, the great quality of life that you'll experience. Jesus said, if you want to experience true greatness in life, become the servant of all. That's the exact opposite. The world says if you have a bunch of servants, you're great, right? That's what the world says. Jesus said, no, if you want to be great, learn to serve. Serve your wife. Serve the kids. Serve your husband. Serve people at work. Serve people at school. Serve people in the church. To be a servant, and I pour my life, and this is what Jesus said, if you want to find your life, lose it. And what he meant by that is become a servant of mine to love me with all your heart and love other people, and you're going to find a quality of life you've never experienced. But do you want to live a miserable life, live a self-centered, selfish life? You will dry up, wither up, and you will be a lonely soul. But you'll be able to do whatever you want in selfishness. Fourthly, in this little picture, they wore these hats. The sons of Aaron wore hats. And the hat is a picture of uh, the effect of, uh, on our minds, that we need the mind of Christ. We need our minds conformed. We need a transformation in our thinking to think right and to think biblically. Well, not only that, do they have the right equipment. They've got, now they've got the power, they've got the righteousness, they've got the servant attitude, and they also have a transformed mind. But in verse 23 and 24 of chapter 8, it says, And Moses killed it, also he took some of its blood, and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put some of the blood on the tips of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet, and Moses sprinkled the blood all around on the altar. And so they made this sacrifice, and here's these people that are going to serve. And if you and I are going to serve the Lord Jesus, this is what we have to discover, that the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, like we see in this picture for the sons of Aaron, is the blood was smeared on their right ear, it was smeared on their right thumb, and it was smeared on their right big toe. What's that mean? Smearing blood all over my body? It means that until that point, they had no ear to hear the Word of God. But now they do. They had no desire to do the work of the Lord with their hands, but now they do. They had no desire to walk with God and to go wherever he directed them, but now they do. And so what I need, what you need, is I want my ear to hear the word of God. When Jesus showed up on the scene, Jesus said a number of times, he says, He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. Why would he say that? Everybody's got ears. I never saw anybody. I mean... And we won't have a show of hands if you've lost your ear, right? But just because you have two ears doesn't, just because your children have two ears, does that mean they listen to you all the time? No, right? We have this thing called selective hearing. That means you hear what you want to hear and don't hear what you don't want to hear. P. 
People are that way with God. But if you're going to be an effective priest for the Lord and to share the hope that we have in Jesus with a broken-hearted world, you're going to have to hear his word, right? You want to hear the good word of the Lord so that you can then share that good word of the Lord. I want to have my hands cleansed with the blood of the lamb so that I can now serve the Lord with my hands. I want to have my feet touched with the blood of the lamb so I want to walk with God and go where he wants me to go. See, it's, it's, it's this beautiful picture in this ancient document about these Old Testament priests that when you understand how it affects you and I, now just think about it for a moment. For 19 years, I did not walk with God. I don't know when you got saved, but I was, uh, you know, you have all kinds of sinners, and I shared with you guys before. You know, there are people that they're on their way to hell because they don't know Christ, but they're going slowly. You know what I mean? They're pretty decent folks. They pay their taxes. They're a decent neighbor, but they don't want anything to do with Jesus, and they're still headed towards hell. They're just, they're kind of going slow. But then there were some of us that we were going to bust hell wide open. Like, I'm going at breakneck speed. Man, I'm going to bust it. If you're going to go, go big or go home. That's the way I live my life. And so at that point, I did not want to hear God's word. When people invite me to church, I'm like, for real? Why do I want to hear God's word? I don't want to do God's will. I don't want to walk with God. I don't want to go where he wants me to do. My ears, I listen to bad things. Why? Because my hands wanted to do bad things. Because my feet, I wanted to go bad places, right? In my generation, and I apologize for my generation, a band showed up that became my favorite band, ACDC, okay? And and ACDC, I remember the first ACDC album that I listened to, and the first ACDC album that I learned, or heard and got, was Hell Ain't a Bad Place, or Highway to Hell, okay? So, I mean, you're just cruising around. I'm on a highway to hell. Seemed appropriate. That's where I was going. And then, you know, they have another song, Hell Ain't a Bad Place to Be. And then they had another album that's Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap, right? Dirty Deeds Done. Sorry. <laughs> right? Okay? But the reality is, is what, what I want to take in. I want to hear bad things. I want to do bad things. And I want to go bad places. But then Jesus broke into my world at the age of 19. I said, how's that going for you? I said, not too good. I'm miserable, I'm lonely, I'm guilty, I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed of the things I've done and the life that I live. I'm just absolutely humiliated and I hope that nobody ever finds out the things I've been doing. I says, yeah, but I'll, I'll wash you, I'll cleanse you with my blood. I'll fill you with the power of my Holy Spirit. I'll, I'll give you my righteousness. I'll make you my servant. I'll transform your mind. I'll touch your ear. You, you'll love to hear my word. You'll love to do my work and you'll love to walk with me. And that's who I am today. I love God's word. I love doing God's work. I, I feel like I am the most privileged man on planet earth that Jesus would love me and that he would use me, that I could serve him. I'm the most privileged man on planet earth from my perspective because, you see, I only live in this body. I don't live in your body. If I was in your body, I would think that I would be the most blessed man. But see, this is the thing. What kind of priesthood do we bring? What kind of message do I bring? What, what do I want to do? What do, I, what do my hands want to lift? What, what do my ear want to hear? What, where do I want to go? Well, check this out. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, Jesus described his ministry. And since we're his helpers, this is what we're going to do. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So now I'm Jesus' servant. You see, most of our work, you guys, is not in the four walls of church. It's when you guys leave here, when you guys leave here, you're going to your priesthood. You're going to your ministry. You're going to your neighborhood. You're going to your place of work. You're going to your family. You're going to scatter like salt and light all over this valley, and you're going to be there for who? For people that are brokenhearted, people that are captives. They're in the bondage of sin. People that are oppressed and depressed and possessed. All the different things that are going on in their life. And we get to share with them, I used to be like that. I used to be spiritually blind. I used to be held captive by the the bondage of my own sin. I used to be poor and somebody shared good news with me. I used to be that. And see, as a a priest, all I do is I, I share with them what Jesus wants to do in their life. And so people think that church is the end all of what we're called to do. No, this was just a big pep rally to encourage our hearts to go do our work. You don't believe me? Check it out. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, what's he say? 
And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints. Look at this. Why does he give the church gifted servants? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We serve one another, but we also, as salt and light, go into our community and we hold out Christ Jesus, the hope of glory, the only means for man's forgiveness of sins, a quality of life, and eternal life. That Jesus can rescue us. So when we come together, it says there was five gifts there, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. My gifting is a pastor, teacher, slash evangelist, because I love to see if people get saved, but I'm basically a pastor, teacher. That means it is my job to teach you God's word, to equip you for the, the saints for the work of the ministry. It's not my job to do all the work, you guys. But that's what most people think when they think about church. The preacher does it all. The missionary does it all, right? That's who, that's who does all the work. No, no. The pastor teacher's job is to train the people that you are a priest and that you can share the life that is in Christ Jesus. We, uh, a couple of brothers in the Lord, we're going to have a baptism at the end of this service, but a couple of brothers in the Lord, and that happened uh, uh, last night as well, that have been a part of leading somebody to the Lord and ministering to somebody in the Lord. You're going to see them come up here with the people that they've led to the Lord, that they've ministered to the Lord, and they're going to help baptize them up here. And I'll kind of step out of the way, and they're involved with that. Why, why is that? Because you're all priests. We're a kingdom of priests. We get to serve. You get to share Jesus. You know, one of the coolest things that's ever going to happen in your life is to share the love of Jesus with a broken heart and watch that person come to Christ and watch their life forever be changed. It happened to me. I started inviting all my friends when I got saved at the age of 19. And I started inviting them to church and, and all kinds of things. But one of the most dramatic things that happened to me was I, started, I saw Tammy. Now, Tammy and I, we celebrate our 29th wedding anniversary next month. But we... We grew up together in high school. I remember seeing Tammy the first time when she was in sixth grade. And, and I was in eighth grade. And Tammy was 5'7 in sixth grade. And, and I called her and her friend, who was also 5'7, a girl by the name of Carlene, I called them the Amazon women. Because I was only about five foot tall. And they were like 5'7. And I went by and I remember I was with my friend Ken Eagleson. And I go, wow, look at those Amazon girls. Now, an Amazon woman is a very tall, beautiful girl, so that's not an insult. She's very tall, very beautiful, and she may hear this message. Okay. <laughs> so the reality is, though, we went, we went together, we broke up, and I was a heathen. I was such a jerk, and she is just a sweet girl, but I went with her, and then I broke up with her and broke her heart, and I went with her, and I broke up with her and broke her heart. But then at age of 19, I'm out of school. I got saved, and she saw me. We saw each other at a 4th of July rodeo. And then she called me and said, hey, you know, I broke up with that guy I was dating, and you want to go out? And we went out. And on the second date, she looked at me, and she was dead serious. I was almost home from uh, taking her on a date. She said, I heard you got religion. you got to tell me about this. And I said, well, I don't know about getting religion, but this is what I know. Jesus died on the cross for my sins, shed his blood, and if I would believe in him and ask for his forgiveness, I would have the forgiveness of sins, and I, when I die, I'll go to heaven. And, and if I don't, I, you go to hell. That's all I know. I hardly knew anything. And, and she, her eye, she's got, Tammy has huge blue eyes. Her eyeballs were this big. She said, really? She said, and right at that moment when I said, but if you don't receive Christ, you go to hell, I had stopped right in front of her house, like just the perfect timing. I said, good night. <laughs> and she looked at me, and her eyes were huge. She said, good night. She said, I, well, I don't want her to go to heaven. And I said, well, you should go in the house and take care of spiritual business, pray or do something, you know, get right with God. I had no ability to help her whatsoever. I didn't know. So I called her the next morning and I said, hey, did you pray last night? And she said, yeah, I prayed. I got down my, you know, next to my bed and I prayed and I asked Jesus into my life and asked him to forgive me of my sins. And, and she said, now what? I said, I have not a clue. <laughs> I had no clue. I said, well, I was already going to church. I said, well, why don't you start coming to church with me? But you know, this is the amazing thing. Tammy is an amazing priest for the Lord. Everywhere she goes, immediately when Tammy got saved, you know what the first thing that she did? She went to school, and, and, and she just started looking at all her friends and realized, oh, man, they, they need God's love. They need God's forgiveness. She started inviting all her girlfriends, and all of her girlfriends were cute. I didn't realize it at the time. I was the envy of all the young men in our church because I kept showing up with a carload of beautiful women every Sunday morning. All the young guys were like, where's that dude get off? Look at all those pretty girls. They're all Tammy's friends. I'm just hanging out with one of them. But, you know, the immediate, and, and she, 
she started looking at her family. She goes, my, my mom, my dad. She, she said, I have my cousins. We started rounding up cousins and taking them to church. And, and, and you know, because that's your immediate response, isn't it? Man, if I'm forgiven of my sins and Jesus can bring this kind of love and joy and peace into my life, I want everybody I know to experience it. And you know what? Tammy didn't even know she was ministering. She didn't even know she was doing uh, witnessing. She didn't know that she was serving as a priest, and that's exactly what she was doing. And that's what exactly you and I should be doing. So it tells us here, and this is the amazing thing, when we begin to do, when we as God's people begin to be who God wants us to be, you know we have that statement in our culture, the right man at the right place at the right time. Let me just share with you, when God's people are doing ministry right, in the right place, at the right time. You know what's going to happen? As we begin to obey the instruction of the Lord, and this is really important because you see you have three dimensions to your makeup. Do you know you as a human, you know what defines you as a person? It's the same thing that defines God as a person. A person, in order to be a person, you need three things. You need an intellect, you have thoughts. You need emotions, you have feelings. You also have a will that chooses things. Okay, so all of us have thoughts, all of us have emotions, all of us can make decisions. We're created in God's image, and that's who God is. God has thoughts, he has an intellect, he has emotions, we can grieve him, he loves us, and also God makes decisions. And you know what, the only thing holding you back from stepping into the full orb experience of acknowledging and understanding that you're a full-time priest in God's service is the decision of your will. Once your mind knows this, once your emotions realize they line up with your heart's desire and you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, you can now obey the Lord and choose to do that. Look at this. In chapters 7, 8, and 9, the word commands is used 19 times. Here's just a couple of them. In verse 4 of chapter 8, it says, So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. In verse 5, Moses said to the congregation, This is what the Lord commanded to be done. Verse 36, So Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Chapter 9, verse 6, Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded you to do, and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. You see, when we begin to do God's work, God's way, in God's fashion and empowering, you know what's going to happen? The glory of the Lord is going to be in our midst. The glory of the Lord for the children of Israel was a tangible Shekinah glory that showed up and fire came out and burned up the sacrifice. We'll read it in just a moment. But you know what? When we are God's people doing God's work and God's ministry, God's way, you know what happens? There's a sense of glory in our midst. There's a sense of meaning and purpose and life. Look what happens as we see the glory in verse 23 and 24 of chapter 9. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consuming the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Check it out. When they were doing God's ministry, God's way, and they were just lining up with God, as we are seeking to do as a ministry, you know what? There's glory. Have you ever went to a dry, dull, boring gathering called church? Have you ever went to a church service and you just thought all the way through the thing as people are yawning and people are snoring and people are distracted? And is, Have you ever just thought to yourself, just shoot me in the head? This is the most awful thing in the world. And yet the reality is that when God's people and God's ministers and servants, you know why Christians are bored in their Christian life? Do you know why Christians aren't enjoying the abundant life? Because daily they do not make themselves available to be as priests. If you start every day of your life and say, Lord, I don't know what you want to do today, but fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit and whoever I run into, can I just share your love? Can I share your hope with them? Can I share with them the light in their darkness? Can I share the, the love in their midst of their unforgiveness and their hatred? Can I just be a vessel to share? Share with others that Jesus is the answer for the woes of their life. Can I just share with them and invite them to come hang out with our church family? And Lord, would you give them a taste of your glory, of your love, of your joy, of your peace? Because you see, that's what people are looking for. But so often today, people aren't doing it the way that the Lord expects them to do it, the way his word lines it out. Do you know, the hurting people around you, are just like that day so long ago. You know, Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, 
the Lord came at the end of that day. It says in the cool of the evening. And it says that the Lord came. And the Lord said, Adam, where are you? Now, does the God of the universe really not know where Adam is hiding? Can you play hide and seek with God, right? I mean, he is the God of the universe. He knows everything. He's everywhere present. But God asks us questions for this purpose. He asks us questions not because he doesn't know where we're at and what we're doing, but to elicit a confession out of our soul of where we are. God knows where you are. But let me just ask you, where are you? Where are you in your heart? Where are you in your life? Where are you in your, have you surrendered your life to Christ? Because you know there's a lot of people at your work. You know, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, you know what they did? They hid themselves, they were afraid, and they sowed fig leaves. They tried to cover up their sin. That's exactly where people are today. They're afraid of God, they're trying to hide from God, and they're trying to cover up their sins with their own works and their own efforts. Fig leaves, I'm told that fig leaves are extremely itchy. Now, is that not the stupidest thing on the planet? I'm going to get the most itchy leaves on the planet and sew them together and put them around my sensitive parts as if I need a rash now. You know what I mean? But that's what people do. Because if they can't forget their sin, then they try to drown their sin and they try to run from God. And that's why people are afraid. That's why they're insecure. That's why you have insecurities. That's why you have fears. That's why you feel like, you know, maybe God doesn't love you, but he does love you. And God came looking for Adam. He said, Adam, where are you? Here you have, you, you've sinned, you've blown it. Now you just need to confess. And you see the Lord, he took care of Adam and Eve. It says that the Lord clothed them with animal skins. Meaning the very first sacrifice for blood to be shed because of the wages of sin is death. And for them to be covered in those animal skins, God prepared the first fur coats in all the Bible. It's like fig leaves or fur coats. Which do you want? I would definitely go for the fur coat over the fig leaves. And yet the Lord says, I just want to cover. I want to cleanse. You know, all the people that you, your, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, the guy in your classroom, the, the, whoever they are, you know what? They're all hiding from God. They're hiding from God. Why? Because they're afraid. Because they're guilty and ashamed. And here's this heartbroken world, and the Lord says, I want to reach this world. And the way I'm going to do it was, is with all my people. Do you know that the guy you work with in your shop, do you know that the neighbor's right next to you? Billy Graham's not going to reach him. Chuck Swindoll's not going to reach him. I'm not going to reach him. I don't live in your neighborhood. I don't work at your shop. You know who God's called to reach? Him. You. You. That you would be so filled with the love of God and the joy of the Lord, and you would pray and make yourself available to be a priest to God, that that person, and this is what I do when I'm hanging out, because I was in construction before I went into ministry. And when I was going to the construction site, I'd say, Lord, whoever you want me to bump in today and share your love with, I want to do it. Now, the construction site's a pretty rough and tumble place, and that's what I grew up with, and people, you know, that are just, uh, they're blank. You, you, you never knew that somebody could call their, insult their hammer with so many names. They're blankety, blank, blank, blankety, blank, blank, blankety, blank. And that's the culture I grew up with, and so it doesn't bother me at all. But over and over, and people would come up to me, and I just... I would be quiet and I would be praying for them. Lord, have them ask me a question. Because once they ask, and even if they didn't like the answer, I would always tell them, you ask. Because how come you have so much joy? I'm like, well, you know, I didn't used to have this much joy, but ever since I gave my life to Jesus and he changed my life, that's, a, oh, you're one of those Jesus freaks. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. Not everybody's stoked about you sharing Jesus with them. So you need to understand you might get some persecution, you might get some haters, you might get, but Jesus said that was going to happen. It's all part of the plan. But can I share with you, there is nothing more thrilling in my life, nothing more thrilling in my life than being a priest of the living God. I get to share the hope for heartbroken sinners because I was one. And when I see broken, guilty, insecure, fearful, stressed out lives. I just want to hold out this hope that we have in Jesus and the forgiveness that he brings. And I want to share it with him. I want to share it with her. And when I do and their life gets changed, man, it's, it's just a mind-blowing thing. I'll never forget some 
seeing the experience of my uncle. My, my great uncle was in his late 70s, and he had heard about Jesus when he was young, and he had ran from God his whole life. He finally came to Christ in his late 70s, and both my uncle's hips were out, but he was so close to death because of emphysema, they were going to replace his hips, so he could barely, barely get up and around. And my uncle, Bill is his name, he gave his life to Christ in his late 70s, and you, his whole life, he was this, you know, just, his countenance was just this sour old man. And that's what, you know, when you grow up young and they're your great uncle, I'm like, man, he's the sourest old man, codger you ever want to be around. And when he gave his life to Christ, the joy of the Lord in that man just was transformative. He was so excited about the Lord. And he told my dad, he said, Larry, he said, I've lived my entire life knowing I'm wrong. Isn't that a bad way to live? Live your entire life knowing you're not right with God. And that's how most people live. Live their entire life not right with God. My uncle gave his life to Christ, but the church that, um, that he could get baptized in, he couldn't get, they had a big flight of stairs, and they didn't have a ramp or anything. And, and my uncle said, you know, I want to follow the Lord in baptism. The Bible says repent and be baptized, but I can't get up those stairs. And he was a little too proud to have people carry him up the stairs. And, and my dad's a builder, and he says, well, Bill, he said, if you want to get up those stairs, I'll build a ramp up that side door. You want, you want to get baptized? He said, you build that ramp, and I'll just, I'll just hobble up the, that, those stairs and get baptized. So my dad whipped out a, a ramp in that next two weeks, and he showed up for the next baptism and followed the Lord Jesus in baptism. He died shortly after that with a smile on his face, right with God, though he had wasted over 70 years of his life, knowing his entire life he lived a wrong life. How do you know you live a long, long, wrong life? I don't have any joy. I don't have any love. I don't have any peace. I don't have a deep sense of satisfaction in my life. And I really don't care about anybody but myself. What a lousy, lousy way to live. When God wants to fill your life with love, belonging, satisfaction, peace, joy, forgiveness. That's why it's the abundant life here and now and then eternal life. Never offer people just the opportunity at heaven. without The Lord gives us heaven, but he throws this life in, man. This is a good life in Jesus. And so we're going to pray, and I'm just going to invite those who want to, if you want to be a priest filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and useful for God, we're going to pray together. Father, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would move right now. Lord, this is your word. It's your direction. It's your heart for us, your people. And Lord, we just realize in this passage where when your people did things the way you wanted them to, it, there was just something glorious about it. And so, Lord, I'm I just ask that your spirit would w do a work of grace right now in the hearts of your people, the men and women. So we're just in an attitude of prayer. If you want to be that priest of the Lord in your family, in your neighborhood, in your home, in your place of work, in your school, and you want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and just make yourself available to the Lord's usefulness to reach out to broken hearts day after day, I just want to invite you to stand here at the end of this service, and you and I are going to pray together that the Lord helps you and I be those kind of priests. Just stand up right where you're at. If that's your heart's desire, God bless you guys. You just want to be used by God. God's going to bring brokenhearted people into your life, and you have the hope inside of you because you've discovered where that hope is in Jesus. Lord bless you guys all over the room. He wants to do that work in our hearts. He wants to do that work in our lives. We can shine bright for him to be the light of the earth light of the world. Anybody else, Lord, just knocking on the door of your heart just to say, you know what? I want to be used in this way. I want to make myself available in this way. God bless you. Those who are standing, I just invite you to pray out loud with me. You and I, we're just going to approach the Lord and we're going to offer ourselves to him in a fresh way right now that we could be his servants and his priests. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I offer my life to you today. I ask that you would fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. That I could be your priest. That I could share your love with hurting people. That I could share your hope with broken hearts. And that I can reach out to people in your name. And I just surrender to you, Jesus. Use my life for your glory. 
In your name I pray. Amen.